Director of Women, Food, and Agriculture Network, otherwise known as WFAN amongst ourselves. And I just want to say thank you all for coming today. Um, we have over 118 people who have registered for today. And so it's going to be a very exciting time. Um, it's also going to go really quick. We're kind of putting a lot of information into a little bit of time. So I appreciate your patience. And if you have questions um, as the in the course of this presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will also have about 20 minutes or so at the end for uh, questions and answers with specific staff or directed to me or whomever you needed to go to. So today's agenda, just so you can overview, uh, we are bringing in, uh, gathering together. And uh, again, intros in the chat, please. Uh, names, pronouns, where you're joining in from and what's your favorite summer treat. Then we're gonna move into where we've been, some of our financial information and membership information. We're gonna look at a programmatic review and we'll look at com uh, our communications and our conference, look ahead to 2025. We're gonna take a five minute break because I have been taught recently that if any meeting goes over an hour, you absolutely have to include at least a five minute break. And then we'll go into our Q and A session at 1250. These are all central time. So here's our team. Um, people don't always understand that we are, we're a small but mighty team. Uh, we have Becky Thorson, and we're moving clock clockwise from left corner uh, all the way around. Uh, Becky Thorson is our finance and office manager. Amy Adams, who is here with us today, and all of us that are uh, here from staff today have a, this background that you can see behind me um, so that you can easily identify staff. Amy Adams is our program assistant. Lauren Morales is our program manager. She's our newest hire, and we are so excited to have her on the team. Piper Wood is our communications manager. Stephanie Enlow is our director of programming. And then there's me, the executive director. We are, this small but mighty team is also supported by a board of directors of 13 people, some of whom are on this call. And if you are on this call and you can wave your hand if your camera is on, that would be fantastic. We'll also be putting um, links in the chat to both our staff bios and our board bios. Um, Piper has done an amazing job of revamping our entire website. And um, there's incredible amount of stories. Our bios are in there and everything else is in there. So I really encourage you to check it out. So why are we having this, this State of W fan conversation? It occurred to me uh, after speaking to a funder and thought partner that we haven't really had a Q&A or a meet and greet since I was um, hired in 2021. And then I was inspired by uh, Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, who did one right after the State of the Union address. And I was like, hey, we could do that. Well, that would be a fantastic way to really bring people up to speed on where we've most recently been, where we're at right now, and where we're going in the future. And it's always good to reflect, celebrate, and envision. It's also an opportunity uh, to meet all the staff in one place, which is really unusual, <laughs> um, both physically and even virtually. And it's an opportunity to share um, and support our June Appeal, which I'll talk more about later, but it's, it funds existing programs and we'll talk more about that later. So what are some of the past achievements? A few months ago, probably about a year ago, founding mother Denise O'Brien and I uh, saw each other and uh, she was showing me the transcript of the testimony of her testimony before Congress about 20, 25 years ago. And because I don't know if, for the Gen Zers, they, they used to print, actually print the hard copies of the uh, testimony. Maybe they still do. But we were looking through it, and it was both discouraging and inspiring. Discouraging because we're still fighting for many of those same asks as two plus decades ago. But inspiring because WFAN's fans still here, and we're still fighting. And we're still hopeful that we get a, a better food and farming system is possible. I present... Um, with some folks with Food and Water Watch here in uh, New Mexico. And one of the things that they often bring up is that it was only 1973 that the system really radically changed to the get big or get out model. And we don't, we reject that. We reject that vision. And so we actually have a different vision and vision, mission and vision that is still as um, relevant today as it was 25 years ago. And that includes our values, the eulogical relationship with the land, interconnectedness, storytelling, ecofeminism, and justice. 
We also created a strategic plan in 2022 that goes through 2025. And uh, the link will be put in the chat. But these are the four main tenets of that. Membership, increasing membership. We want to get to 5,000 engaged members. We have 11,000 people who are, are kind of lurking and uh, on the edges and, and, and oftentimes co-thought you know thought partners. Um, but we really want to engage 5,000 people um, with WFAN. And that what does that look like? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, also, fiscal responsibility speaking to that as well in this in this presentation movement building like what is this what does movement building look like as we move together and also really increasing uh women and non-binary leadership in regenerative agriculture so 2023 highlights time seems to be accelerating uh, i can't believe that you know 2023 was less than six months ago or just about six months ago and in full disclosure, 2023 was a pretty rough year. Um, it was a very challenging year for WFAN. We had several losses of family and friends. We had health challenges, we had staff transitions, and we bring our, our whole selves to work. And sometimes that means working through grief and pain and illness. So we are truly grateful for the grace and patience of our members, our board, and our partners. I'm also really grateful to Piper who at about six months ago, compiled a wonderful end of year summary um, that reflected our, and reflected our achievements. And I'm only gonna be able to hit on some highlights because I have to move through this quickly, but I really wanted to highlight that uh, in, in 2023, WFAN Stewardship Ambassadors hosted and spoke at over 30 events and collectively reached over a thousand people. We had 17 mentees across six states who completed our HOP program. We launched our first Stories of the Seasons project. We held our first in-person conference since the lockdown, held it, we held it in Ames. Many of you were there and it convened over 60 um, WFAN members, staff, board, and longtime co-conspirators. Also early in this year in 2024, WFAN supported uh, Hawa Varney, the executive director of Liberia's Women, Food, Women in Agriculture for Sustainable Development or WASUDAV to attend the UN Commission of the Status of Women and Stephanie and I both attended DC fly-ins and met with our members of Congress to discuss farm bill priorities. So here's a question that we get often asked um, about our financials. And I wanted to just take, tackle it head on. Why does WFAN always seem to be fundraising? Fundraising, fundraising, um, including right now, which is our June fundraiser. This is a breakout of our funding um, by how it, it comes across. And so right now, this is based on the approved budget that we've approved back in January. And that is um, that 64% of our funding was coming from grants and contracts. 23% is coming from um, foundation support. 6.5% is coming from contributions and 6.5% is coming from other. Now I wanna briefly talk about what that means in real time and what that means for us to um, be able to function as a as an organization. Yes, we are excited to to receive uh, public funding and we have uh, several grants from the USDA, from SARE, from um, City of Cedar Rapids and others that I'll show in a minute. But all these grants, those those grants, those public grants are what's called renewable I'm sorry to get in the weeds, but <laughs> they're renewable or the refundable grants rather. So that means that we have to pay out first um, and then invoice those funders for the, re, uh, the reimbursement. And so when you see this, 64% of the funding has been contracted or has been said, yes, we will fund you. We are still only have 36% that have to cover those costs. <laughs> so this causes a, ca a cash flow issue. And that is why we are always looking for uh, unrestricted funding, uh, particularly from, um, from foundation support and from, from you all, from our members and our supporters. And gratefully, um, we, this is a projection now because we were able to, with, especially with huge thanks to organizations such as No Regrets Initiative, uh, Regenerative Ag Foundation, uh, Harry Chapin Foundation, we were able to get some of that uh, unrestricted or at least um, flexible funding, and that allows us to be able to pay for to pay out um, for the costs that we have, and then re re get reimbursed. Um, and sometimes those reimbursements are slow, and so this 
cushion um, this more balanced view of funding really helps us um, be able to do the things that we are, aspire to do um, in a timely manner. So who are our funders? These are many of our funders. Um, we have the stairs, like I mentioned, the USDA, we have a BFRDP grant that supports our Harvesting Our Potential program, Cedar Rapids that works with Women Caring for the Land, a Regenerative Ag Foundation, uh, and No Regrets, and um, American Farmland Trust, Harry Chapin Foundation, Patagonia has been a huge supporter. And these are this balance of funding between um, between foundations and uh, public funding is what really makes the, the magic work. Also this year, I'm excited to announce that we are um, serving as the fiscal sponsor for the Queer Farmer Network. And so as, a, as the fiscal sponsor of the Queer Farmer Network, we are able to support them in, the, in holding their convenings, which is, uh, they're amazing. And we are so excited to be able to do part of that, be a part of that. But this has been a learning process for all of us as we become fiscal sponsors and um, start to move through some of the challenges of um, accepting money on behalf of the Queer Farmer Network. So if you do present, provide, uh, a donation to the Queer Farmer Network, you'll see that it comes to WFAN, but just know that we are stewarding that money with them um, and we will, it goes out to back out to their programs. So now I'm gonna get it, oh, oh, just also briefly speak um, to our membership and financials, um, or our membership model. Our membership model is unique. Uh, we are, you can become a member through a donation of time, of talent, or of treasure. So treasure, of course, is, is a financial donation, but time and talent are also equally as important. We are so appreciative of those that serve on our board, that serve on committees, that are able to um, provide additional support to us through uh, blog postings, through uh, webinars, through all the, there's a myriad of different ways that you can become involved with WFAN and we encourage you to reach out to myself or to Piper to be able to learn opportunities for becoming uh, a member through time and talent or treasure donations. So now I will go to uh, the WFAN programming because this is really a lot of the meat and potatoes of what we're doing. And I wanna say that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, or stick around for the Q&A at the end. Um, all of our programming has developed, has evolved from member needs and requests, and it continues to evolve. Staff, um, staff are all involved with the WFAN programming from Stephanie to Lauren to Piper, Amy, myself, even Becky. Um, it's all hands on deck, but Stephanie is really at the helm as the director of programming. So the first program we'll talk about is what we refer to often as HOP, which stands for Harvesting Our Potential. So Harvesting Our Potential is our pairs aspiring and beginning farmers with experienced mentors for two to three month mentorships. And what we uniquely do is we provide a $750 stipend to both mentors and mentees. Um, oftentimes there's programs that will only pay for mentors um, and they don't really support the mentees. And that model where we provide $750 stipends to both sides of, of the mentorship has been very successful for us because it acknowledges the needs um, of the, our members and mentees and as they go into it. And it can be used for action projects. It can be used to pay for babysitting. It can, in childcare, it could it be used for transportation. Anything it is a $750 unrestricted stipend to be able to really engage and attend um, and be part of their mentorship. Our current funders for this program include North Central SARE, Western SARE, um, and that's under GoFarm, Harry Chapin Foundation, and of course the biggest funder here is BFRDP. Our current areas served um, include six Midwest states as well as Colorado and New Mexico. And our goals for 2024 are that we will have 20 Midwest mentor pairings and seven Western pairings. And we have already exceeded this goal. Um, I'm excited to share with that. Um, I am huge shout out to Stephanie and Piper and Amy for all, and Lauren for all their dedication to this program. Um, we are trying some new things every single year. And this year has been um, 
a challenging one with, with getting some of that infrastructure in place, but it is coming together and we are so excited um, with the way that things are coming together and be able to track these exciting mentorships. So the next program I wanna to speak to is Women Caring for the Land. And when I say Women Caring for the Land, it used to be sort of a monolith understanding of what it was. It started learning out with uh, learning circles for landowners to gain knowledge around how to implement and collaborate with their tenants to implement agricultural conservation. And that has expanded to include having dedicated stewardship ambassadors who share their knowledge and experiences with others in their communities, their triumphs and their challenges. And I'm gonna, ask that there be links and there's going to be links placed in the chat to learn more about the stewardship ambassadors and some of their exciting stories um, and their experiences. As mentioned earlier, last year over 30 um, presentations and reaching a thousand people is a very impactful program. Another thing that we included um, this year was Stories of the Seasons project. And that opens up co-creative spaces for members to share stories, observations, challenges, and strategies for coping under climate change. This project includes a cohort of Iowa-based land stewards who are working to co-create a multimedia, multi-methods ecological calendar. It also includes a zine and a, and a community poem project. So speaking of the zine, although the, the zine timeline has closed, thanks to, it was led by Amy Adams and many of you contributed to our first time ever a zine project. The published work is coming soon and if you missed the submission window, you still have time to, for some of that creativity bursting out of you um, to and encourage you to join our community poem and submit a poem, a sonnet, a limerick, a reflection, what have you, into our 365 community poem project. And that link will also be put into the chat so that you can, you can still be a part of our sharing our stories of the seasons. Through a partnership with the City of Cedar Rapids, Source Water Partnership, we will have three learning circles this year, primarily oriented towards women who can who own land in the Cedar Rapid, their Cedar River watershed. This year, we are building connections with farm managers who can support participants quickly, identify high priority conservation practices on their land. Staff are encouraged, uh, are currently engaged in intentional learning and relationship building with the goal of WFAN being more actively engaged in land transfer transition efforts. This includes the exploration of non-familial land transition, including through land connection to land navigators, the development of farming cooperatives, as well as making connections to black, indigenous, and people of color who are seeking, far, to, seeking to farm and ranch. Our funders for the Women Caring for the Land project include the USDA SIG project, the City of Cedar Rapids Source Water Partnership, and pass through private funding from the American Farmland Trust, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, Administration Climate Adaptation Partnership Program. So please keep an eye out. Um, we have additional comms coming. Piper has started to uh, send out anytime that we have Midwest events uh, over the next several months. They're going out rapid fire through social media as well as on our listserv. If you want to get on that listserv, please reach out to Piper or myself and um, and we will we will hook you up. Our second to last pro program that we're going to mention in, under programming is Plate to Politics. So prior to the pandemic, Plate to Politics was done in partnership with Vote Run Lead. And Vote Run Lead is a partnership that we hope to build again in the near future um, as we need to lift up progressive women in politics more than ever right now. The changes that were forced on, upon all of us by the lockdown provided an, us an opportunity for to re-engage in policy work in a new well, not a new way, but in, in re-engage in a way that we hadn't done um, with so much intention and didn't have the capacity to do prior to the pandemic lockdown. So what does that look like? That includes our joining or re-engaging rather with the National Sustainable Agricultural Coalition, which we will often refer to as NSAC. Uh, we are longtime members of NSAC, but staff capacity limited our engagement. We've grown in staff and has enabled us to become more active in committees, including the Racial Justice Committee and the Climate Change Subcommittee, as well as participating in fly-ins and meetings at the, with congressional leaders. Uh, and about six months ago, or so, or sorry, about six months into my uh, service with, as the EDOW fan, our application to the National Family Farmers Coalition, or NFFC, was accepted 
we were so excited about this. And we were made full members of this um, Values Aligned Coalition. And it has been an exciting journey to be a part of NFSC. We were working on um, and working with organizations such as the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, Kentucky Black Farmers, La Via Campesina, Rafi, and so many others. And when we're in community with NFSC, collective liberation truly feels attainable. So both NFFC and NSAC have been and continue to be uh, and to continue to work diligently on the Farm Bill. Uh, last year, as mentioned earlier, W, oh, I didn't mention it earlier, but last year, WFAN hosted a Build a Better Farm Bill webinar series that is posted to our website. And more Farm Bill resources are coming soon, as well as an action alerts about appropriations bills, marker bills, and more. We signed over 20 letters of support with various bills and positions, and we meet with members and have met with members of Congress. And although challenging, right now is not the time to let up. The Farm Bill is still in play. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic that we will see one by the end of this year. As someone you know, it was pushed off uh, a year from last this time, or September of last year, and now the deadline is September of this year. We're not entirely sure how it's going to go, but we are uh, watching it diligently and keeping track of where the um, Senate is going to go. The House bill has already come out of committee and is theoretically up for a vote, but it's not been called for a vote. Um, the Senate version, um, we have, have we've had two uh, versions that have come out, one from uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow um, and then the other from the Republican side. And uh, there needs to be some reconciliation between uh, all of these different versions of the Farm Bill and visions for the Farm Bill. And it's really important when we have action alerts that we reach out to those that are involved in the Farm Bill to be able to say, hey, this is what is values aligned and what we need as farmers uh, in America. So if, we, if you are interested in doing fly-ins, um, if you're interested in petitioning or making phone calls, please let us know and we would love to engage you in that work. Uh, especially as this is a face of election year. In July, of, um, in July, WFAN, will, we're going to pivot a bit to a get out the vote push. And it's based on our continuing theme of vote your values. We're watching races across the country, including some of our very own WFAN members, which we're excited to um, support and connect with resources. We intend to challenge candidates and when possible to outline their positions uh, and platforms with regards to sustainable agriculture pricing parity, small bar farm insurance, and so many more issues. Um, movement, or lack thereof, on two marker bills um, we've been watching closely include the Farmland for Farmers Act and the Women in Agriculture Acts. Um, we continue to watch them. Haven't seen a lot of um, movement in terms of putting them into the farm bill, but we are um, excited that they at least made it to the table and that we hopefully will start to see, if not, fully integrated into the Farm Bill, some elements of it integrated into the Farm Bill. So now I wanna speak about growing community resilience. So growing community resilience started um, initially during the pandemic lockdowns, as many of you know, and it was a way to build space so that farmers who had always met in person um, had to adapt and pivot to um, the realities of, of meeting together in a virtual space. And then came the racial reckonings from the murders of George Floyd, Brianna, Brianna Taylor, and so many others. And we at WFAN recognized that we could not just sit idly by and not acknowledge um, the racism and um, issues that we have in, in the food and farming systems. In 2021, 2021 and 2022, we created space to have to hold anti-racist conversations and explore collective liberation. Um, intersectionality wheel. This is a this is an intersectionality wheel that Maritza um, Beer had presented during one of our growing community resilience um, conversations, and I think that this is something that we need to bring up again and again and again because. Um, these conversations are not going away um, and they need to still be held and they do shift and they change. And as more people become aware of the issues around racism, um, classism, every, all of these intersecting issues, um, there needs to be spaces to have frank and open conversations about it. 
So even though in 2023, we wanted to be sure to incorporate anti-racism throughout our programming um, and not as a standalone component, including improving language access, website upgrades for multiple languages, um, translated trend, strategic plans and theories of change, we know we have to do better. Um, in particular, as we're seeing the funding cuts to organizations serving Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, and the rollback of exceptional DEI programming and protections across the country, we are committed to doing better and living our anti-racist values and co-creating spaces for deep and hopefully transformative conversations and action. So now I'm gonna pivot over to communications and conference. And I'm very excited. So I wanna speak briefly about uh, our very own Piper Wood. So Piper came to us originally as a conference assistant and uh, helped put on the virtual conference in 2022. And then in 2023, she was hired on as a, the membership engagement and communications coordinator. I hope I'm getting these timelines right, Piper, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, membership engagement and communications coordinator. And then in the middle of 2023, as I mentioned, it was a very tumultuous year. She was thrust into the position of communications and conference coordinator and is now our member, our manager of communications and has been a remarkable and she's excelled in every single position. This year, I'm excited to say that um, she has become the manager of communications, um, quickly tracking to become our director of communications and is a uh, an amazing uh, addition to the team. She's no longer in charge of conference. We will talk more about conference in a moment, um, but she's definitely involved in the process of co-creating our next conference. This evolution of our communications over the past year, as many of you has noticed, has been exciting. From regular social media, regular social media engagement to evolved storytelling, action alerts, uh, fabulous webinars, information packed newsletters, and so much more. We're constantly seeking to improve our communications with WFAN members and that we can be the most, so that we can be the most responsive to your emerging needs as possible and make supportive connections across our network. As mentioned earlier, Piper also led our first in-person conference since 2022 pandemic lockdowns as it was held in Ames and purposely kept small by pre-pandemic standards, um, but was still very well received and filled up quickly. Many of the, the 60 people that are currently on this call were in, in attendance. Following the conference, we did some deep, we did some deep reflection as staff. We decided to establish a biannual or every other year in-person conference. This new approach ensures that helps ensure that we have the proper staff and contracting ability, funding, and that we can be as responsive to emerging needs and topics by identifying outstanding speakers and facilitators. We will continue to have virtual and in-person meetings and presentations in off years, such as 2024. For example, we are sponsoring several PFI field days this year, as well as presenting with the American Farmland Trust at the Kavira Conference in early November in Denver, in Denver, Colorado. We hope you can join us. We recently held our first planning session um, for the 2025 conference, and we are tentatively saving the dates for da -da -da, Friday, November 7th to Sunday, November 9th, 2025. Please save the date. We will be bringing on a new conference coordinator in early fall this year. So if you are interested, if planning a conference is something that interests you, please keep an eye out and ear out for that position posting, as well as all WFAN members are encouraged to join or provide suggestions to our conference planning committee, as it is your conference. And then I'm just gonna briefly speak to our spring appeal and why WFAN, why now? This is my last soapbox moment. Um, I want to ask, answer the question to why support WFAN in, in 2024. And in the past year alone, we've seen a systemic attack on women's rights. The, the continued decimation of our environment and the increasingly unhealthy corporatization of our food and farming systems. And just yesterday, I learned that white male farmers in Texas have sought and been awarded an injunction in Texas against black and women farmers who were being provided debt relief. Um, there's a link that will go in the chat for those that are interested in following that conversation. The UN has declared that in 2026, we're gonna have the year of the woman farmer. <laughs> of course, we believe that every year is the year of the woman farmer and that while recognition and declarations are all well and good, we wanna see action taken. 
We need child care subsidies for, farm, for farming families. We need a liaison to the USDA that speaks to the challenges faced by women and non-binary farmers. We need to bring back and integrate farming and ranching techniques that honor and utilize indigenous knowledge for improved soil, water, and air and so much more. We need to be giving access to black farmers who have lost their land and their farming traditions to be able to re-engage um, and have access to land. If you believe in WFAN's programming and you, that we seek to create a just and ecological food and farming system, I encourage you to support our June fundraising appeal and member appeal, and the link will be in the chat. Our camping goal is $7,500, and as of this morning, we were at just 20%. We have raised just over $2,000. So we are so, so grateful for your continued support, whether it be time, talent, or treasure that you contribute. And I would like to take a five minute break. Um, I know we're running, thankfully, a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, I felt, I, I apologize if I spoke way too fast, um, but we're gonna take a five minute break and then we're gonna come back for uh, the Q&A with the staff. I'm hoping that, I, I haven't been able to see the chat yet. I'm looking forward to taking the, this five minutes to like look through the chat and answer any questions uh, during the Q&A that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you for pausing and restarting the, the program. I wanted to address some of the questions that I saw come up in the chat. Um, Well, thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, yeah, so some of these questions have been answered. Uh, we do not currently receive funding from the Walton Fam Family Foundation, um, but we will definitely take that into consideration. We would love to meet the folks and see where our alignment is. is. Um, also, yes, happy Pride Month. Um, I know that there, there's always an ask for um, multiple places to be able to start. Um, mentorships, but right now we're at full capacity <laughs> for being able to provide mentorships in other states. However, to Stephanie's point, we are, you know, always looking to um, find opportunities in the future to hopefully connect um, and engage in other, in other regions beyond the current eight states that we're in. Um, Missouri is one of those eight states. And Yes, there will be a recording um, after this meeting that will be available. And also that uh, recording is going to be translated into Spanish as well. And we're also looking into figuring out how to put captions um, th through AI uh, on the recording as well, if it can follow my Chicago speech <laughs> pattern of um, speaking awfully quickly sometimes. We have not determined where we're um, going to have the 2025 conference, but we're leaning towards somewhere in Iowa. <laughs> and if you join the conference committee, you can weigh in on that. <laughs> it was a privacy message to me, but I will announce that I'm going to be on Deep Roots Radio on this Saturday morning from 9 to 9.30 Central Time talking about WFAN. Some of the information may be duplicative from what you've heard today, but if you can tune in, that would be fantastic. Just Google Deep, Deep Roots Radio. Um, they talk about all things sustainable ag. Uh, there was a question in the um, in the in the Q&A, for the Q&A session that their wife is not a farmer and that's not a requisite to being a member of WFAN, um, but they are running for state senator at Senate seat in, in Alaska and they support our goals and our values, they're aligned. We, we cannot as a 501c3 endorse any candidates, just to put that out there. Um, it's been something that's come up during this election season, but we can make connections to uh, other organizations such as we mentioned, Vote Run Lead, um, and others. Uh, we also have several um, candidates that are running across the country um, from our membership base. And it would be interesting to um, to make, we can make, try and make connections between those candidates as well. 
Um, and yes, um, we are going to get back into supporting women who are running for office. Um, but yes, I would say definitely look at Vote Run Lead um, if her if her platform is. Oh, thank you. Piper's going to put some vote, vote resources into the chat. Fantastic. And then, um, please, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat, and we would love to to take those this time. Can't see the view. Okay, so if there's no questions at the moment, I'm gonna call on Stephanie. Stephanie, can you tell me like one of your favorite either success stories or just stories in general that's come out of some of your programming? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that one of the programs that I'm especially excited about this year is our Stories of the Season project. Um, and through that project, um, we have convened a group of about 15 uh, women, genderqueer uh, land stewards um, who have different types of relationships with Iowa land. Um, and we've been meeting over the past seven months or so um, to talk about or tell stories um, and share observations of changing climatic patterns, um, our you know, lived environments, and to really use those stories as a launching pad to build collective knowledge around um, how we can all be better coping with climate change. So um, whether that be really tangible um, action, like implementing cover crops, planting more prairie habitat, uh, et cetera, or whether it be um, the more emotional side, like how do we frame our climate grief um, to ourselves in a way that helps us live with it? Um, and how do we build more community connections? So that's been a space that's felt really hopeful and inspiring. And out of that project, we're going to have a number of offerings, including a really um, multimedia, multi-methods type of ecological calendar that will have both a print and online version, um, as well as the zine that Jules mentioned earlier that Amy's really been spearheading, um, and then the community poem. And the folks who are taking part in that cohort are also doing their own action projects um, with their land. Uh, and some of those are just really exciting and inspiring to see. So um, yeah, that's been a great project. And I think it's a, a fun place to bring together uh, folks who um, have all kinds of different production systems and relationships with land um, to share our collective knowledge. Awesome, thank you. What What's an action project? Uh, there's a lot of flexibility around what an action project can be. Uh, the idea is that it should in some way um, help the person who's implementing it to feel like, gosh, I hate the term climate resilience, but we'll just use it because it's easy and right there to grab um, to become more resilient, um, whether it be, again, in like an ecological resilience or relational resilience way to climate change. So that might look like buying cover crop seed and working with their tenant to get a cover crop planted on land for the first time. It might look like expanding an existing prairie habitat. It might look like um, doing some beekeeping and prairie plantings uh, with their neighbors to build intention intentional community with those neighbors as an, and as an act of educating the next generation. Um, so we're supporting those action projects with a little bit of um, reimbursable funding as well. Fantastic. All right, now I'm going to put you on the spot, Piper. <laughs> You've done some amazing changes. Um, can you over the last, gosh, two years, but really in the last year, just a overhaul of our website, um, whole overhaul of our entire communication strategy and planning to be able to be able to better connect with our members. Can you talk to some of the things that you're most excited about and um, what your ideas are for the for the upcoming year? 
Yeah. Um, I feel like with the Stories of the Seasons project and our Harvesting Our Potential um, mentorship cohort kind of getting off the ground and this being a farm bill year, um, we have been harvesting and in stewarding folks' stories from every corner of our membership. And it's such a gift to be able to have someone's story shared with us and also to have their trust in us to share it with the rest of our community uh, to hopefully inspire some action uh, in whatever direction, uh, whether that be farm bill action or um, just building some of that emotional resilience and community that Stephanie was talking about. Uh, I think I'm really excited we have been um, a contributing member of the uh, Strategic Coalition on Narrative. It's called the Scone Coalition. It's a it's a group out of northeastern the northeastern U.S. Um, and they kindly let us be a part of it. But um, they ex are exploring a lot of how we build narrative and and really build stories with our communications. And it's been really beautiful to build coalition with a group that is so deeply values aligned. Um, and in that group, we are sharing best practices for how to ethically steward folk stories, um, as well as how we can actually move the needle by by creating strategic narratives that, that we can all recognize and that resonate with all of us. And so um, I'm really grateful to bring our membership and our members' interests to that that coalition, um, in addition to other coalitions that we're part of, like NSAC and NFFC, uh, because it, it feels really like we're able to amplify the voices of the people in our network. And I think um, at the end of the day, the one-on-one -on -one conversations I have with members, whether that's at a tabling event or at, you know, over email, um, those conversations really like give me a lot of hope for where we're headed. And um, everyone is so gracious with their stories and their um, their vulnerability of what they're dealing with. And I think like that humanity in storytelling is is just so such a gift to to our network. And I feel um, really grateful to to all of you for your trust as we steward those stories. So I'm I'm just really excited to keep building that um, storytelling web for our network and our network members. Awesome, great. There was a question in the chat. Can you mention the name of that coalition, uh, I think it's SCONE? What did SCONE yeah. stand for? Yeah, um, I think the SCONE is like the best, the best uh, way to put those letters together, uh, but it's the Strategic Narrative Coalition. Um, and I will, Mariana, I can also uh, reach out to you and get you an actual contact with the folks that are running that coalition. Um, it's out of the Food Solutions New England and um, all of the the University of New Hampshire kind of food coalition groups. So it's very Northeastern based, but um, the messages are universal. So uh, yeah, hopefully you can, you can get in, in touch and involved with them as well. And I also just want to echo something that Stephanie put in the chat and acknowledge Linda Shank has been an amazing uh, thought partner and collaborator um, for our Stories of the Seasons project and all the way around. Yes. Hi, hi, Linda. Glad you came off camera. <laughs> um, I, we could not do so many of these projects without, without her help. And so I just thank you. Huge gratitude to you. Lauren. You thought you were going to get away. <laughs> I'm going to bounce it to you now. Lauren is the newest member of our team. And I just wanted to, can you just give us a little background on what brought you to W fan and, um, you know, how, how you see your role and where, where you hope to go? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Lauren. Um, currently joining you here from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, yeah. So I have been, working in like urban agriculture and food justice since about 2016. Um, it's the same year I graduated with my degree in sociology um, from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Um, but yeah, so just kind of working in that sort of sector. Um, and then I took a brief 
time away from agriculture to kind of just regroup. And near that end of that time, W Fan posted that they were hiring and I, I took the chance and, you know, it really worked out for me, which is super cool. Um, and I'm really enjoying my time here so far. Um, have had a big focus on the HOP program. Um, getting mentees through into the program and getting them onboarded has been like our main focus um, the last several weeks. Um, and where do I want to go? I don't know. I would I would love to stay here for as long as I'm possibly able to. Um, and I haven't really thought much farther out than that. I'm very focused on the present currently. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Amy, <laughs> she's got tech help in her name right now, but to say tech help is so, um, <laughs> barely takes the tip of the iceberg of what Amy has done for us over the last year. Um, as a program assistant, she has, set, it's, it's the invisible work, but it's the critical work um, that Amy has really done um, She's also done some visible work, <laughs> but the invisible work has been really helping us set up our infrastructure and um, our back end, our back end policies, procedures, approaches, um, identifying the areas where we need to um, make improvements uh, in terms of communications, in terms of filing things, in terms of guarding our passwords, <laughs> all of it. She's been a very essential um, team member, but I really want to talk to you, Amy, about what your inspiration was for the zine and then also this community poem that people can still contribute to. Sure. Yeah. So I came to WFAN um, about a little over a year ago um, in March of last year and my first as a staff person, a part-time staff person. Um, and my first interaction with WFAN was as a harvesting our potential mentee um, at Mustard Seed Community Farm with Alice um, in 2021. And um, at that time, I had just finished up a graduate program in creative writing and wanted to do something um, that felt completely opposite um, from that. I it was also in grad school in the pandemic and just really longing to be outside, to be with other humans and animals and plants um, and to learn some really hands-on tangible skills um, and was so fortunate to land at Mustard Seed uh, with Alice and with the whole team. And I still am involved in that community farm um, and that complements my work here really nicely. Uh, and then writing is still a part of my life as well. And um, I think really the zine idea um, came through the wonderful synergy of the Stories of the Seasons project, that ecological calendar, thinking really deeply about um, just tuning life um, to the rhythms of the natural world, whether someone's engaging with that through land stewardship or through farming or a creative practice of some kind. Um, and then being able to bring together many stories and many voices. And I feel like that is really beautifully exemplified in the work that we do at Mustard Seed um, as a community farm and as a really grassroots organization where uh, we really value the contributions of every person, every plant, every animal, um, every pollinator um, involved in, in making us who we are. Um, and so it feels really beautiful um, to do that as well at WFAN uh, and to bring together a really a multitude of creative energy. And so I just feel very grateful um, to be part of a really awesome team that's helping that come to life. Um, and then I also want to plug that an upcoming event that WFAN has um, is we are sponsoring a Practical Farmers of Iowa Field Day at Mustard Seed on Sunday, June 30th. Uh, so if you're in Iowa, um, we would love, or nearby, um, we would love to see you at that field day. And that will also uh, be an opportunity for some of our harvesting our potential folks um, to meet each other, um, come with your mentor, your mentee, meet some other people in the program, um, meet the mustard seed mentees. It's going to be a really fun time. And I think there will also be ice cream. Ice cream is key. <laughs> um, yeah, I had such a great time um, at the WFAN conference last fall um, when we went to the, the field field trip to Mustard Seed. 
just being in community with everybody, singing, um, learning about seed saving, walking the fields, it was just a magical experience. So I'm glad that we're continuing our ongoing collaboration. Like uh, somebody said, uh, Piper said in the chat, uh, Mustard Seed is one of our longest term uh, HOP mentors. And so we're really grateful for all the work that you do over at Mustard Seed. Thank you. Well, it doesn't look like there's any additional questions and I'll give people one last shot to ask questions. And otherwise I will give you your 15 minutes of time back. I will make one last plug, um, completely selfish plug um, from, a, from a fundraising standpoint. So all of us uh, on the board and, um, and NEON staff have our own personal fundraising pages and we all have our own little um, incentives for donating to uh, WFAN during this June appeal. Mine is that I am also a beekeeper. And so the first four, 15 people that donate um, $40 um, or more through my link, and I'll put the link in the chat or I will um, send it out. <laughs> um, we're already, the, the, they will receive a 10 ounce jar of honey. And then if you donate more than $5, you will be uh, entered into a drawing for a two pound jar of honey. So just wanted to throw that a little additional incentive. Um, if you don't get through my link, just put it in the, um, in a note when you when you donate to the to the June appeal that you want to be included in the honey draw and I will include you in the honey draw. So thank you all so much for coming today. I appreciate all that you do. And oh, thank you, Josie. And, and likewise, and again, if you um, have stories to share, if you would like to be a part of a fly-in, if you would like to um, donate time and talent in a blog post or uh, other ways, please reach out to myself uh, or any member of the team and we will, we will find a way to engage you. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week and um, we'll talk soon. Thanks. I'm Jules Salinas. I'm the executive